So let's let's get started. Let me share my screen with you. Okay. All right. So today, let me minimize that. Uh, today we're going to discuss some specific loan documents. So I sent an email out this week and I asked for your help if you had any uh, documents that you have problems with explaining to the borrowers or you just don't understand yourself or want a little bit more clarification. So this is a compilation of uh, the ones that got the most requests. So there are some that are not on there that were, um, that were sent to me. Uh, we will get to them at a later training session. You can always email training at c2csignings.com if you have any questions and we'll answer them just as soon as we can on a specific loan um, document. Uh, that training email is if you if you have friends that want more training, send it over their way. Uh, it's open to, to anybody. So this is just a compilation of, of what I would say are the trickiest documents, the documents that most notaries have trouble with initially. So that's what we're going to go over today. Okay. All right. So why do we need to know these documents? Signing agents aren't allowed to provide advice or give their opinion regarding a signer's documents or loan terms, right? That's not our place, it's not our job. Uh, I like to think it of, of it like we're not allowed to answer the signer's questions relating to the why and the hows of a signer's loan documents or their loan terms. So if it's, why is my interest rate this way? Or how did they come up with that figure? It's not our place. We go to the loan officer, we go to the escrow agent or we ask the company that's hiring us. But we can answer the where's and the what's concerning the loan terms. So if a borrower says, where's my first payment? We can show them. So we need to know how to navigate the docs to find that. And we can also answer the what. So if they say, what's my interest rate again? We show them the document and we can answer that question. So that's to me just the easiest way to put it. Can't answer the why's and how's, we can answer the where's and what's. As a signing agent, we should feel comfortable guiding the signers through the documents and be able to provide a general description of each form. Uh, every signer is different, right? You might have a signer who's done this a million times and doesn't want to look at anything, right? They're just signing away. Those are our favorites, right? But then we have signings that and signers that they have questions and they need, they, you present a form, they're gonna ask, what is this? I need to know more about this form. So it's our job to be able to guide them through the docs. So we can provide general descriptions of the docs. This is gonna help the signers better understand what they're signing and just generally make them more comfortable with, with the documents that you're presenting. Having a grasp of the purpose of each form will also increase your confidence. This is the biggest thing. When I first started out, I didn't know what the docs were. So I'd maybe say the name of the doc and then just hope that they wouldn't ask me what it's all about. And then I'd have to take it back and read it and then kind of reiterate it. So if you know the general purpose, you're gonna be more confident. The signing is gonna be more fun. Eventually you'll kind of memorize the script and the form will come up. Even if it looks a little different, you'll have a general idea of what it is and present that. The signing is gonna go faster and you're gonna have a better relationship with the borrowers. They're gonna love you. They're gonna think, wow, this person really helped me through the docs and did it in a painless way. So you don't wanna provide a script that's you know a page long, which will, have the signing take forever. Um, really just a simple sentence or two can help the signer feel comfortable and it'll help you kind of wrap your head around what we're signing. So that's why I think it's important to get to know the documents. So we're going to go over some of these like heavy hitting documents that every new notary has questions about. And even notaries who've done it a, done it a long time will have questions about. Okay, so first off is the trust certification. This one is a hard one. Um, but it's a lot more simple than it appears. So if the signer's home is in a trust, this form will be present most likely. Its purpose is to confirm the signer's trust information. Like I said, it looks more complicated than it actually is. It is not necessary for the signer to reference their physical trust. So sometimes signers will go, well, I guess I have to get my trust out and they go into their safe or they have to dig around for it because it's not something you look at every day, right? It's not necessary. 
all you need is located in the trust verbiage, which is found underneath signature lines on documents like the deed of trust, grant deeds, or even on the trust certificate itself, like we're gonna see in this example. If this information can be, can help you guide the signer in filling this form out. So it's gonna help the signer you're gonna help the signer fill this form out by referencing that signature line. Now, if a signer is not positive on an item, because there's some items that that signature or that uh, trust verbiage, the signature line, aren't going to address, but are pretty general, um, you can skip the question and maybe place a note saying that that information is not currently available. But this form must always be signed and notarized. So this is a common error we'll see in the quality control department is that this form will come back blank because the signers don't know how to fill it in. We can help them. We have access to the majority of this information. So you wouldn't want to skip it because the signers don't know how because we can help them fill it in. So let's look at that form. So here's that a, a sample of a trust certificate. The first line is I, we, and then you put in the trustee's name. So look at the bottom of my page. This is oftentimes included on, like I said, the form itself, a grant deed, a deed of trust, note, it'll have it. So I know who the trustees are because it says so right there. So in this case, it's uh, Eli and, and myself, Eli Cherbo and Virginia Cherbo. Uh, next is the name of the trust. So you go back down, the trustees of the Cherbo Family Trust. So a Cherbo Family Trust um, is currently in existence and was executed on, look for the date insert the date. Uh, the next section, the, the settlers of the trust, that's the same as the trustees. So put the names found in the signature line. Same with the currently acting trustees, it's going to be the same. Put that there. The next item is the power of the trustees include the power to sell, convey, and exchange. If they're doing a refinance, then they have that power. So that's yes. Same with B, which is the power to borrow money and encumber the trust with the deed of trust or mortgage. We're doing the refinance, right? That's a yes. Most trusts are revocable. In fact, in my career, I've never seen a re irrevocable trust being refinanced. So most likely it's revocable, which means they can amend it. Uh, the next question is the trust does or does not have multiple trustees. Again, this is easy to know because look at the people listed. In this case, there's two people. So you check does or have the signer check does. The next question is a little tricky. If the signer has multiple trustees, the signatures of most of the time it's all, which means all trustees must sign off on a transaction. That, that's why sometimes on a grant deed, say there's a husband and wife and then one of their moms is in the trust. The mom will have to sign off on that deed as well because all signers or all trustees must sign the forms. So generally it's all, again, if the borrowers aren't sure and they generally know, you know how many trustees there are and who has to uh, execute the, the forms, we can skip it or ask the signers if they you know, could get that information, but you really don't need to pull out the trust most of the time. The next is the trust identification number right here. This is generally one of the signers social security number. So Thanks, it's whoever Virginia. is the point. Oh, go ahead. Can you take a can you take questions during this or do you want to wait till after? We'll wait until after. So they if we want questions, go ahead in the in the chat section and add them and some of our team will answer them and if they don't get to it, we'll answer it in our Q&A. Okay, thank you. Thank you for asking. Okay, so then the very last one which everybody has trouble with or at least a lot of people is title to trust assets is to be taken in the following manner. That's the signature line for the trust. So basically you just insert that whole trust verbiage there and put it all right there. That's what you do. So that's like a quick overview of how to fill in the trust. Um, at the end of today, I'm gonna send you a copy of this um, PowerPoint and you can review it. But again, we're gonna take questions at the end. So write them down now or get ready to raise your hand. But that's the trust cert. Um, again, just to emphasize, do not send this back without a signature and notarization. Escrow will come back and say, why didn't this get filled out? And you need to go back and get it done, right? So we don't want you to have to make a second trip unless you're getting paid for it, right? So fill it in, very important. Okay, the next form, everybody has trouble with this one as well. This is the preliminary change of ownership. We sometimes call it a PCOR or PCOR. This form always accompanies a deed. So grant deed, quit claim deed, 
warranty deed. Some states have uh, different versions of this form, some affidavits, but this is the general form. Uh, it's recorded alongside the deed. So this form comes into play if the transfer is tax exempt. So if it's a um, exchange that is exempt from taxes for a list of reasons, this form is gonna be included. So um, it looks intimidating, right? And when I first did signings, I thought the same way and I didn't, I messed up a lot of times, but it's actually pretty simple for refinances, which is the majority of what you're gonna be doing, right? So when you're filling in this form, you always must reference a grant deed because they're linked. That what the grant deed says, that's what the PCOR is gonna reflect. So I have an example here. This is the grant deed read the grant deed to see what's happening. So in this case, Eli Cherubel and Virginia Cherubel as husband and wife are granting the property to Eli and Virginia as trustees. So this is just transferring the property as individuals to trustees in their trust. So this is moving the property into a trust. So that's the purpose of it. So as for the PCOR, generally this is blank here. The borrower can fill in the buyer section. They're referred to as the buyer in this situation if they're the borrower of a refinance maybe. You can fill this in. If you don't, escrow will. So it's not critical that everything is filled in, but if you're, if you're with the borrowers, might as well do it. And then we filled in part one. Really on this form, all we need to fill in is part one and check the appropriate box. So why you have to get to know what the grant deed says and become familiar with grant deeds is because one of these options is the correct option. There's all sorts of options here. There's transfer between spouses, um, domestic partners, because one of the borrowers or signers died, um, uh, transfer of location. So sometimes that this is required. These are all tax exempt transfers, right? So you don't have to pay taxes on this transfer. In this case, for trust signings, when you're taking the property out of the trust and putting it back in, which you see a lot, you're gonna choose item K here at the bottom, which says that this is a transfer of property to and from a revocable trust that may be revoked by the transfer and is for the benefit of the transfer. So that's K item one, and it's the first item. So you can direct the signer to choose the appropriate item. So you can give them options. So if I was at a signing, I might say, why don't you read section K? That looks like it applies. And then they'll check K and say who it's for. So it's the benefit of the transfer. And then we need a signature on the second page. So you actually don't have to fill in two through four. It's really for purchases, new purchases that you'd fill that in. And you need at least one signature. If there are two signers that sign the deed, you can put two so they can sign right next to each other or below, one line below. But you need at least one signature on this and a date. So that's real generally how you fill in the PCOR. Again, get to know the grant deed because that's gonna give you the information that you need to fill this form out or to have the signers fill this form out. And some of them are interesting, right? Some of them are a perfect match, but the signers to fill, to check one of those options. So read the form, get to know the options, and then look at the grantee to decide. And if you are unsure of what it is and the signer's unsure and you're both kind of stumped, call the company who hired you, call the escrow agent and see if they can provide us a little insight. Um, reading the forms is really critical, getting to know the forms. So that's the PCOR. I'm sure there will be questions on this one for sure. Okay, next up, and I, I almost everybody who sent me a request sent me this form, the gap indemnity agreement. Um, this is sometimes in escrow documents. So it's generally not in the lender stocks, but the escrow stocks, and there's a reason why. So this is an example of one. First off, an indemnity is a security or protection against a loss or other financial burden. So it's a protection on behalf of the person who, who issues it. Um, this may be requested by the title insurance company from the borrower to minimize its risk during the time between the signing occurs and the actual recording of the documents because there's a gap, that gap part of the name of the document, of time between the closing and the recording of the forms. 
So in a sit down closing, which is what most of us do, right? Regular signing, <clears throat> the title issuer, insurer, assumes the risk that nothing will be recorded that could cause the title insurance policyholder a loss. So the gap indemnity agreement minimizes that risk posed by the gap in time from the signing and the recording of the docs. So by signing this form, the borrowers are acknowledging that the title company issued this policy. So it's a protection on behalf of the, the title company and the borrower because there's a delay, right? So generally we sign the documents, uh, the docs get shipped to escrow, then they get shipped to the lender, and then the recording may happen you know, within that week, but there's a, a gap, like a weak gap. So it basically protects escrow and title and the borrower. So the borrowers aren't choosing this option. This is just saying that this is what a certain title company issues. This is a policy that's required by their company policy. This form is note, signed, dated, and sometimes notarized. Sometimes it's not. In this case of this example, there is a jurat present on this form. So that's kind of just a summary of this form. That's really what it means. Um, I'll be honest, this is a hard one for me too. I remember the first time I saw it, I was reading it because I thought I was real good and knew how to explain all the docs and I had to read it and then think about it and then issue and then say, you know, tell the borrower. So it, it does feel complicated, but just think of that gap. There's a gap of time between the closing and the recording of the docs. So this indemnity protects whatever could happen during that gap of time. Again, I'm going to send you this as a PDF so you can review, kind of memorize and get your script ready on your own. Okay, signature name affidavit. So why is this issue? These are the names that come up on a borrower's credit report as possible aliases, right? Or AKAs, names that they may be known as. Depending on the format of the document, the signer may have to sign for each of their AKAs or make a note that they've never been known by that name and initial. So I'm gonna give you a sample of both of these forms. These are the general forms you're gonna see. So the one to the, to the left is pretty common. So it has my name right here, the way that the loan docs are written up. So Virginia Cherubel. So I sign just like I normally would for that form. We also have my maiden name, Virginia White. I've been known by that name, right? So that's what you have to tell the borrower. Have you ever been known by that name? Well, yeah, that's my maiden name. Okay, then sign for it. Sign the way you normally would sign for that name. So I'll sign Virginia White. What about VA at Cherubel? That's my notary name. So I need to sign for that, right? And they can't just do their normal signature. They actually have to sign for it, right? Virgin VA Cherubel or Virginia White. So it actually has to match the way that the name is posed. What about Ginny at Cherubel? Yep, my friends and family know me as Ginny. So I'm gonna sign for that too. But what about Vir Ginny Bittner? That's not me. I've never been known by that. So instead of just leaving it blank, which is a common error, we actually have to write never known as, and then initial. The borrower may also cross off the name, but beware some lenders don't allow cross outs, right? So just make sure to keep that in mind. Never known as, and then initial. So if you come back and you just have the borrower sign this one form and leave all these blank, that's an error, you're going back to the borrower and it can delay funding. So it might not be caught until the day of funding. And then they're like, you better get this done in an hour because that's how long we have to fund. So then it becomes a rush, right? And what if the borrowers are now out of town? We have to hire someone else, it gets complicated. So if the borrower refuses to sign by a name because they were never known as that name, like me with Jenny Bittner, that's not me, never known as an initial. But have them sign for all the names that they are known as, known as. And it can be a pain. You know, sometimes borrowers are like, where'd this name come from? Well, easy answer, from your credit report. Someone somewhere along the line, applied for credit with that name. So what if you're getting a credit card and they typed in your name wrong? Or sometimes names get crossed, right? So that's where it comes from. Don't let it stop the signing for this form. Never known as an initial will suffice. Now to the right, we have another sample of a, a general format. In this case, they kind of just list the names, right? If the borrower doesn't like the alias is there, they can cross it off and do the same thing never known as and initial. So you have to designate if there's a problem, cross it off, initial, never known as. Again, make sure the lender allows cross out, some, some don't. Uh, this form is always notarized with either an acknowledgement or a jurat. I'd say most of the time it's a jurat. The borrowers are promising that these are their AKAs, their aliases. They're promising the truthfulness 
of uh, this document. Another little quick common error, this notaries will forget to notarize, especially on this form to the right, it's kind of sneaky and hidden. So they'll forget to stamp, they'll forget to fill this out. Always triple check your work. And if you haven't attended my signing agent 101, we're gonna do that again, probably in the next two weeks, attend. Um, and we'll kind of give you the common errors that we see every day. But yeah, that's, that's the signature name. All right, this is a report and certification. This is just for VA loans. So if the uh, borrower or co-borrower is a veteran and they have a VA loan, this form will be present. This document helps confirm the with the lender um, that's closing the loan that the loan meets certain VA guidelines and regulations. The VA borrowers or buyers will also verify their intent to occupy the property as their primary residence. Um, I was asked where we sign this form. The second page is where we sign it, have the veteran sign, and if their spouse is on the deed or on the loan, have them sign as well. Date as well on this one. Now there is this little sneaky hidden bit on uh, 28, what is that, 28A. Um, if the borrower does not wish to fill in this kind of voluntary information, it's basically government monitoring purposes, they can initial there. Otherwise, they have to fill in 28B through 28D and 29D if there's a co-borrower. So they'll have to fill in their ethnicity, their race, and their sex. So if they don't want to do that, that's okay. They initial right here. Um, there's one lender that if this is missed, that I know of, there's probably multiple, but one lender that I know, we're going back and getting an initial. So slow it down, look at this form. If there's a spouse, have them sign as well. This is another form that looks intimidating though, right? It looks like all these cells, where do they sign? Look for signature line, uh, an X or signature of veteran or signature of spouse. So that's the report and certification. The uniform residential loan application. So if you watched my um, first uh, training that we did a few weeks back, I went over the um, old 1003. We have a new 1003. Just a quick summary of what this is. This is filled out in the beginning by the borrower or their loan officer. This is uh, the borrower's personal information. Um, I've never actually done a signing with this new form. So it was kind of new to me, um, but this is what it looks like. It looks way confusing and I'm just personally not happy about it, but what does that mean, right? I have nothing to do with that. Me not being happy about it means nothing. It's not gonna change the form, right? So we have to get to know it. Um, the first page has an initial and isn't it a sneaky little initial right here? So if the borrower is applying for joint credit, there's multiple people on a loan and they're getting the loan together. They have to initial there. So make sure to get that initial if it's joint credit. Previously, we'd have a signature at the very top of the first page, which was always missed um, and didn't need to be signed if it was just one person getting a loan. Now it's replaced by an initial. And then there's a signature on page five. So it's a signature and date on page five, basically under the section that's section six, acknowledgements and agreements. So slow it down when it comes to this form, look for those initial and the signature. Um, there's less signatures than there were on the original form, but it, I feel like the formatting's longer. It's like two pages longer in some cases. So slow it down, look at it, look for that initial. If there's a co-borrower, have them initial. If not, there's no initial required and then a signature on page five. Okay, next up, this is also maybe number one or number two of the most requested form. And I don't blame you. This one I actually think is hard um, and it I have to really slow it down for me to, to describe it. So let's talk about it. Now, if you're not in California, this isn't gonna apply to you. There may be a variant in other states, but this is a California regulation. So if you're in, I saw a lot of people in Chicago and in, in New York, Florida, um, Arizona, this may not apply to you, but there may be a variant of this form. So it's good information anyways. Or if you're doing a signing where the property is located in California, but the borrowers are located somewhere else, you might get this form. So it's still important for you to know. So California regulation states that a borrower cannot be required to pay interest or that per diem, that's daily interest, for more than one day prior to the disbursement of the loan. So that's what it means. You have two options. So you see right here under my highlight, these are our two options that we give to the signer. The first option, if you select this box, the borrower does not agree 
to pay for any potential additional per diem interest of more than one day. So this will just follow the normal loan funding process. Option two is select this box to fund as a special circumstance where you do agree to pay for the potential uh, total additional per diem interest of more than one day. So the special circumstance, maybe your rate is expiring. You're signing around the time that your, your, the borrower's uh, rate expires, or they need the funds sooner than the normal funding process will take. So they're willing to pay a little bit more interest. Um, in this case, it says, you know, up to three days, I believe, a total of 66 additional dollars to fund the loan sooner. So that's really what it's all about. Now, some lenders, if this form doesn't uh, come back completed, they will make the borrower get this form re-signed and they have to check an option. Now, while other lenders, and this is kind of just an insider tip, some lenders, if it doesn't come back filled in, they will manually check the first option because that's kind of the default option, which is to not pay any additional per diem interest because they're just gonna be a regular loan funding normally, the way it normally would. So that's really the purpose of this form. Um, the next document that I'm going to show you is from a specific lender that provides this. Uh, and it's an amazing description, which I pretty much just took that description from this form. So you're going to get a copy of it. This is something that if you're nervous about explaining this form, which I understand, you present this first and, and let the borrower understand which option to choose. So this is a really great form. I would suggest printing a copy and keeping it in your notary stuff in case you get a borrower who's, who's not super eager to sign this document because they don't know what it means. Okay, so then we have the 40, uh, 4506T and the 4506C. This is the request for the tax transcripts of the borrower's tax returns. So this form will list the years that the lender required to approve the loan. You're gonna see that here kind of in the three quarters of the way down. Uh, the top of the form is going to tell you who needs to sign it. So say most couples file jointly, but if the lender doesn't have both of their names, you only need to have the borrower whose name is listed sign the form. So in this case, it's just me, Virginia Cherubel, and I just need to sign it. So you don't need to add the spouse's name and then sign for it. It's whoever's name is pre-printed at the top. Now, what if there's no names pre-printed at the top, then we can add both signer's name and have them both sign it. So if it's kind of blank and it's left for us to fill in, the borrower can absolutely po put their spouse if they file jointly. Otherwise, if it's pre-printed, you just need to sign the person whose name is pre-printed on the form. They're the only ones that require signature. There's also a real sneaky little hidden box right above the signature. This form basically says that, that the, the person who signed it is the person who's uh, um, the taxpayer in question, really. So sometimes it's pre-checked, sometimes it's not. We have to check it if it's not. And that's something that you can do in front of the signer or have the signer do it because you're watching them sign. So you know that they're those you know, taxpayer in question, um, but make sure that's signed. If it comes back and say in offices where we have quality control people, which we do, um, they will check that. So do it ahead of time. So we're, you know, they don't have to do it for you. That's that form. I believe the 4506 T and C are, are the same formats. So it's just gonna be kind of interchangeable. Okay, another one that I got a few requests on is the, the social security, um, the authorization for the Social Security Administration to release the signer social security verification. So this is the request to verify the social the signer social security number from the Social Security Administration. So when I present this form, I ask the borrowers to verify the information up at the top, make sure their social, the date of birth, their name is correct, maybe the reason for why they're obtaining this release because they're getting a mortgage so that the lender has to do this. And then there's a signature about three quarters of the way down and a date. Now there's this initial above, read the initial and it'll tell you if it's required. So it says this consent is valid for 90 days from the date signed. If the borrowers want to change that consent date, they can, and that's when they initial. So if they're not gonna change it, they don't need to initial. I've never had an escrow company kick back because of that initial not being there. So it's optional. All right, next up, equity payoff letter. 
So I've had a lot of issues with this lately, just uh, in our company with escrow companies coming back to us. So normally this is an escrow form and it's uh, accompanied by a quit claim deed. So a quit claim deed is when one person who's on ownership of the house or title gets deeded off the property. So that's it, they quit their claim to the property, right? So it's when someone's being taken off title or ownership of a home. So this is for the person that's being deeded off the property. They need to complete it if they're being paid off or given money in exchange for having themselves taken off the property, right? Or they're bought out. Um, the form, even if that's not the case, right? What if it's just a transfer between uh, parents and their child uh, where they're, they're basically just giving them the home? So even if it's zero, we have to add that. It must be completed. It must have an amount on it. Like I said, even if it's a zero. So if there is an amount due though, right? So someone is being bought out of the property, then the good through date and the per diem must be completed. So they have to put the amount that they're being given and when that's good through and then their peak per diem thereafter. So say there's a, you know, they, they wanna be paid off before next Monday. So that amount is good until Monday. And then after that, they're charged, you know, a per diem or daily interest on that payoff. So again, there's a note there that says, if there is no equity owed to you, please put zero in the above spaces. So if escrow is getting close to funding, it's funding day, and then they realize that this isn't filled in, it delays funding, which means people are waiting to get their money, right? So it's important. Um, this is a, a form that we have issues with just all the time. So make sure to have the borrowers put zero if they're not getting any money back. And you can pretty much present it like that. The person who's deeding off, are they getting money in the process of you know, getting bought out? If they're not, put zeros all the way around. If they are, fill it in. And then generally it's the person who's deeding off as well as the people who are still on title who have to sign for it. So make sure that everyone gets signed. Sometimes it fo is followed by a notarization, which makes sense, right? Especially if there's money involved, it's important to get that notarized, makes it official. So make sure you uh, it gets initialed, signed, notarized. Um, if you fail to get this filled out, escrow is gonna consider that a notary error. And so they're going to make you have to go back, get it re-executed and re-acknowledged. So it's, you know, it can be a pain to, to fix it after the fact. And sometimes, and think about the possibility, sometimes there's a reason why they're getting bought out, right? In cases of divorce or family problems or just, you know, taking someone off the loan. They were only supposed to be on for a few years and now it's time. So they might not be in the same location. So having to get this filled out again can mean a hassle. It means going to two different locations. So make, make sure you get it done right the first time. All right, so just to wrap it up on my presentation, let's give you some tips. Um, if you're unsure of what a document means, ask the company who hired you. Um, that should be your first thing, ask us. If we're slow to responding, which means we're crazy busy and we're just trying to get through the day, search the internet. Um, I did that when I was creating this um, uh, a PowerPoint. I searched the internet just to make sure that what I was saying was what the truth is, you know? So search the internet. There's so much information out there. Uh, you have to do some digging sometimes that you'll find good information. And then my go-to is always read the form. Read the form. If you're still not sure what it means, at, you know, go through all your avenues. Ask coast to coast or whoever hired you. Search the internet. Um, if you have a mentor, ask your mentor. You have training at C2C signings, ask training at C2C signings. Um, don't stop the signing or into signing because you don't know what the form is. You know, get an answer. Scream until you get an answer is what we always say. Um, another tip is do not leave documents blank or unsigned without letting everyone know. So if the borrower refuses to sign a form, first off, you should call coast to coast. Maybe they can help or whoever hired you escrow lender, depending on if they're comfortable, the borrowers want to do that. Now, sometimes the borrowers will say, I'm not signing that form. Okay, that's fine. Don't let it stop the signing unless it's like the note D kind of big stuff. Get through all the other docs and put a note on the form with a post-it note and let the company who hired you know. Everyone needs to know. This will happen where we'll get a set of docs back, a, a signature is missed. And then we look on our website, there's no notes we call the notary and they're like, oh yeah, borrow refused. You want to make everyone's job easy, right? So communication is key. Put a note on the document 
put it, when you add status, especially if you're working with coast to coast, when you add completion status, make a note of that. Borrower refused to sign the per diem document. Um, what'll happen is sometimes that form maybe doesn't need to be signed or you're gonna go back or the borrower can print it and sign it themselves if there's no notarization required, but, but they need to get signed. So if it doesn't happen, communicate. Now, if you fail to execute the forms accurately, so you make a mistake or you make a call that's to not sign a form or not complete it, there can be delays in funding and recording loans. There may be penalties, fees that occur that the signer has to pay, the lender has to pay, escrow has to pay, or coast to coast signing companies have to pay. Now, I don't know if other signing companies do this. Um, I know that we do. If a notary makes an error and it results in a missed mortgage payment or um, a rate lock extension or a combination of both of those or more, coast to coast will pay those fees in behalf of the signer if it means keeping our client happy. Now you can offer your e &O insurance if it's a legitimate mistake that you made and that may cover it, which is awesome, but we don't want that to happen, right? So that means that when you're on a signing, slow it down. If there's an issue, a problem, ask. Scream until you get a response, really, because the penalties can be high. Uh, Lisa Bittner at Coast to Coast, she's paid thousands and thousands of dollars. <clears throat> I don't even know if we know how much, but that's to keep the, the borrowers happy and our clients happy. So. It's a horrible feeling incurring rate lock fees. I've done it before and oh man, it feels horrible. And us as a notary, we might not have the income to pay $2,000 worth of fees or more. So coast to coast will do that. But of course we don't wanna do that, right? Because you know that means we're, we're all losing money. Um, and another note on if you miss a document or you fill it in inaccurately, um, that might require another visit to the signer. And the lender will not pay you for that. Escrow will not pay you for that, unless it was something that wasn't your fault. But if you failed to have a form filled in accurately, escrow and the lender do consider that your responsibility. So they're going to consider it a notary error and they're not going to pay us more and they're not going to pay you more, right? So it's important to keep that in mind. So if at all possible, get it done right the first time. We're all going to make mistakes though. You're going to make a mistake, no matter how good you are you're never going to be perfect, right? So if you're going to make mistakes, um, mistakes are good. You'll never make that a mistake again once you've had to go back to the signer and get something completed. It can be kind of embarrassing, but be professional about it. And borrowers are generally professional about it too. You'll get, every once in a while, get a, a tough borrower who's mad about something. Um, try to see it their way and just get it done. Apologetic. Don't be proud. Don't be difficult. Um, at Coast to Coast, you're going to make mistakes. We're not going to penalize you for mistakes, but we might not want to work with you if your attitude is bad. I had a notary do kind of a crazy thing the other day. He, he went to two jobs and gave one borrower, the other borrower signed copy as their copies of docs. And I kind of figured it out that that's what happened. And I told him to call the borrower and they had the doc. So it all worked out, but he was so like, oh my gosh, I hope this doesn't affect our standing. And I said the way that he jumped, cause it was true. He was like, I'm so sorry, what can I do? Let me get it done. I'll get it done now, whatever it takes. The way he jumped made me give him a positive note on his profile. So we're not gonna penalize you for making errors in that we're not gonna put negative note if your attitude about correcting it is good. You know, if you're, if you, or take responsibility or accountable and then get it done, we're going to love you because everyone's going to make a mistake. Um, it's all about how you fix it. And that's kind of the saying that the owner lives by. We can fix anything. So don't go MIA. You have to get things corrected urgently. So right then, drop what you're doing, get it fixed and take responsibility. And no one's going to be mad at you. Everyone's just going to be happy that you got it done. So there you go. That's my little presentation on some individual forms. Um, if you missed uh, a form that you really wanted me to describe, shoot an email to training at c2csignings.com and we'll get to it. Um, another quick note, a lot of people asked about reverse mortgages and HELOC signings. Those are, those are kind of wild, right? So we're going to do a whole nother program just for those two kind of the common issues and errors and what they are so you can kind of understand them better. Um, but I figured we'd be here all day if we covered all of that. So 
we'll I'll definitely plan on a session for just that. I'll let everybody know. It may be next week. I'm going to go over my schedule and see what's up next. Um, but we're going to get to it. So if reverse mortgages, I know people who will never do them. I wouldn't be scared of them. They're just like any other product. You can do it and you can do it well. Thank you.